All right. Um, I read a book a few months ago that really caught my attention, was really eye-opening to me. And the information in it, I feel is really important um, because I, I know that it spans a lot of age groups. Um, and I know I've, I've seen it have a significant impact on people that I know. And um, <clears throat> there's information from the, a book that I, that I read that I wanna share with you tonight that I think can have an impact in your life or in the life of someone you know. Uh, the book is called Lost Connections. Uh, it was published in 2018 uh, by a, a Swiss gentleman, Johan Hari. Uh, he's a writer and a panelist. Uh, he started taking antidepressants when he was 18, and he took them for 13 years. And um, so he's uh, he knows quite a bit about it, coming from you know firsthand experience. And uh, the book begins by him having a, an anecdote about this time that he was in Vietnam and he ate an apple and he got incredibly sick. He almost died. And when he went into the doctor, um, the doctor said, the nausea that you're feeling is important. It's important for you to feel that nausea, that sickness, because that helps us know what's wrong with you. That helps us know how to help you. You've got to be able, you've got to feel that nausea. Um, Talking tonight, uh, a lot of my slides will say you know, depression. That's not necessarily the f the the focus. the The focus of the book is depri de depression and anxiety. So when I say depression, I'm I'm lumping the two together, even though those two are are different things. But in the book, he he lumps those two um, those two together. So they uh, oh, quite a bit overlap there. And I wish, you know, this book is, is relatively short, but there are so many gems in it, so many, um, you know, aha moments, so many studies that he references. I wish I could get into a lot of those studies that he talks about in the book, but um, uh, I encourage, you know, after you, after you uh, listen tonight, if you have more questions or you want more information, I really strongly encourage you to look, uh, to read the book and for yourself and, um, and pull out a lot of those, those gems out of there. Uh, a lot of things that he talks about, he, he refers back to over and over. And one of them is you know, what we've been taught, uh, as, especially as a Western society, is that depression is a result of a malfunction in the brain and that malfunction is caused by low ser serotonin levels. I'm sure that's uh, something that maybe all of us have heard uh, at some point. We're also told that this malfunction can be solved you know, with, with drugs, with antidepressants that repair that brain chemistry. We've also been told that depression and anxiety are carried in your genes. Um, now, mm, throughout the book, he talks about the role that genes play and the role that medications have in depression. And because they do have a role, but um, the bulk of his book is to explain why that story that we've been that we've been told is um, is not helpful. Um, it has given us an explanation that is wrong, um, and so in having that wrong explanation for what's going on with our, you know, with our emotions, we look for the wrong solutions. Um, so that's kind of where we need to begin here. Is what are the what are these other solutions? What are the other factors? What are the causes that uh, that are contributing to anxiety and depression in in teens and adults? You know, across the board. Hi, Jaya. Yeah. Hi. Um, the three questions that he had at the beginning of the book, as he was taking these antidepressants, he had these questions. You know, why why are more and more people feeling depressed and anxious around me? Why does this seem to be to become uh, kind of an epidemic of sorts. He also asked, you know, if I'm taking these antidepressants, how come I still feel depressed? You know, he'd go into his therapist and his therapist would say, you still seem depressed. He's like, how can I be depressed? I'm taking all these antidepressants. Um, but he was still having all these, all these symptoms of depression, even though he was doing what, you know, doctors and the, 
uh, people of the day, the, the leaders of the day were trying to uh, explain what was wrong and this is how you take care of it. So he started wondering if there was something other than brain chemistry that was causing his depression and the depression of so many other people. And he kind of breaks them down into three umbrella causes, uh, social causes, psychological causes, and biological causes. And those are kind of the umbrella causes. And within that, there are um, about nine reasons or nine factors that um, contribute to depression and anxiety. And within those umbrellas, there are all sorts of you know unique situations that might be unique to you or someone you know. You know, his, um, his book can't span exactly every sort of circumstance that would trigger a de you know, depressive episode, but these are the causes that kind of have that umbrella that, um, that overreach uh, all of the, um, the main things that we might have in our lives happen in our lives. So I'm gonna go over those tonight. Um, I wanna spend a, the bulk of the time talking about the causes that he mentions, and then at the end, we'll talk about the solutions that he, that he talks about. Uh, the first one that he talks about is a disconnection from meaningful work. Again, the title of the book is Lost Connections. He talks about all these, these social or psychological connections that we should have that are important for our well being and how we disconnect from those things and those disconnections have an adverse impact on our emotional health. Again, the first one being a disconnection from, from meaningful work. And he, you know, he gives anecdotes and stories in, in the book. So again, I encourage you to read, read that if, uh, if you get a chance, if you haven't already. Uh, he talks about the amount of control you have over your work correlates with your emotional health. Those that go to work every day saying, uh, you know, dreading work because they don't have the autonomy that allows them to um, feel like they are doing something that they want to do with their lives can really adversely impact their their emotion health, emotional health. He talks about a disconnection from other people, and this is one that I think is really um, um, uh, obvious. Uh, you know, in my in my view, is pretty obvious. Uh, today, I think it's kind of at the forefront of a lot of people's minds as that disconnection from, from other people. We just get so wrapped up in, in ourselves and what we're doing. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people that are lonely because of that. And he explains that loneliness is not being, you know, by yourself. Um, loneliness can happen, you know, in the middle of a large city where nobody knows you, even though you're surrounded by people. It's uh, loneliness is not sharing um, things that matter between the two of you or between you know the within the group. You got to have those shared experiences, those uh, sharing things that matter with each other. Uh, he also talks about how you know in in eons past that um, you know the, the bands that grouped together, you were kind of in this, this tribe that helped one another and saw each other through challenges and trials and, you know, whatever they went through. But over time, we have dismantled those tribes. And because we've accepted this idea that are the, you know, the sayings that you have to, you know, you have to dig down and no one can help you but you and you're in charge of yourself and, and all those things that, that are kind of along those lines, we've kind of accepted those into our, into our, as a mantra. For, and, um, and that's where we've gone wrong, that uh, we've focused our, our energies inward for pulling ourselves. It's like it's up to us to pull ourselves out of whatever predicament that we're in. And whether it's you know physical or psychological or whatever, we've, we've dismantled those tribes that are essential for, um, for that support. Um, so that disconnection from other people, I think, is really salient right now, that we need to be looking for um, looking for our, our, our place as a whole, as a community, as a, as a unit. Um, the third one on this page is uh, disconnection from meaningful values. He's got this phrase, I, I think he made it up, they're called junk values. Junk values like, um, you know, status, power, um, 
you know, things you can buy, money, whatever it is that take us away from our passions, that cause us to compare ourselves with others. And the real, the real reasons these things have an adverse effect on our emotional health is because they're not meeting our most important needs. And they can poison our, our relationships with other people because they get us so focused on, you know, how we're doing or how we look to other people. Um, it just it just weighs us down with with unnecessary anxiety. So um, that's the third one there. The next one I think is uh, one that might be familiar with um, with many of you. We've talked about it quite a bit, especially in the West Valley District. We've had a number of uh, seminars and discussions about the, the prevalence of ACEs, which are adverse childhood experiences that can um, really have an emotional impact on, you know, an impact on our emotional health, on our well being, especially as we grow older. We may not see the immediate effects of those traumatic events, but over time, um, you know, the, the science is there that tells us that those compound. Uh, on each other and can lead to significant health problems and, and emotional problems. And he says the, the studies that they've looked at tell us that the emotional abuse, if, if a child experiences emotional abuse, it's more likely to cause depression than any other kind of trauma. Uh, the one, um, the one, one of the gems that he reiterates over and over in the book that I think is really key to remember is that uh, depression is a normal response to an abnormal experience. Um, there are There's a section in there that it talks about the similarities between depression and grief, and we'll get to grief on another slide, but, you know, grief is a, is a normal response to, you know, a, a, an abnormal experience or traumatic event, and depression is along those same lines. It's just the way we've been framing depression, the way we've tried to handle it, um, that has not, it's not pulled us out of those depressive episodes um, as, as we hope or as we're told that it will. Um, the next one here is disconnection from status and respect. Um, you know, having an insecure low status, uh, you know, at your job or, or your, your social connections can make you feel that you aren't important. And that can really weigh down on your on your psyche and 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 really play play a big role in your emotions. Oh, going back, um, one one other thing he said about trauma that I thought was key is that trauma can lead to depression because uh, it leads you to either think that you are powerless or that it was your fault. And those are the things that I think, um, especially young people um, that experience a traumatic. Uh, event or maybe an abuse of some kind um, that weighs on them and that can lead to depression because you have two choices. You think I'm, I'm powerless. There was no way for me to stop it. It was going to have, you know, I couldn't have stopped it or that I deserved it. And both of those ways of thinking are, are damaging to, to a person's emotional health. The next one is a disconnection from the natural world. Uh, we have this built-in desire that's innate in us to be in the natural world and our need to move, uh, to connect with nature. And when we take that away, um, we, uh, we inflate that ego. We inflate that, um, that idea that the world is um, about me or things are happening to me, or um, you know, maybe I'm not part of this bigger picture, but when we get out in nature, being in nature shrinks our ego. We look at the majesty of, of what's around us and we realize uh, you know, how, small, how small we are and sometimes how small our, our problems are. And um, you know, getting out in nature is, is incredibly therapeutic. And many of you might, might know that, that uh, you know, being out and, and hiking and biking and you know, whatever it is that you do out in nature has a real positive impact in, in how you feel about yourself and about life. Um, the last one here, disconnection from a hopeful future. And th often this kind of goes with uh, people not having their basic financial needs met. Um, it, you know, not having those needs met can keep you from seeing further than the day you were in. Um, when you're, 
when you're uh, struggling to make ends meet um, <clears throat> and, and something, you know, something unexpected happens to you that just kind of brings you down, I think you're more apt to say, man, my life is just going so terrible. When you have a hopeful future, when you're able to see beyond, um, you know, your day or your week and you're able to see in, into the future there, you can say, you can look at that grand scope there and say, I'm not really having a bad life. I'm just having a bad day. But overall, you know, this this will pass and I'm not having a, a bad life. I'm not stuck in this uh, in this spot that I feel like I'm in now. Again, he doesn't discredit the, the work that's been done on, uh, you know, gene research and, and medications and all that. There are great advancements there. Um, but we need to be careful again in saying that that's, that's the cause of what's going on. And to look at that, he, uh, he references some twin research, which is a great way to, to find out you know, how much of this is inherited and how much of this is, is not. Uh, this research study that he cites here is that depression is 37% inherited and anxiety is between 30 to 40% inherited. Geneticists have found that having a variant of this gene called 5-HTT can lead to depression if it's activated by an environmental trigger like childhood trauma. So it's kind of like it's kind of like a light switch. It's there, but by itself, it's not going to move and cause depression. It's got to be activated by something else that's going on. So another way of saying it is genes can supercharge this genetic factor, but it's not going to create it all on its own. It gives you the uh, maybe the propensity for for depression or anxiety. But having that gene doesn't doesn't mean that you're gonna that you're gonna be depressed or need to be on antidepressants or whatever. So again, the danger in the story that that we've been told that you know depression is a malfunction of your brain because you have low serotonin and this and that um, it has three dangerous effects, and this I think is really really important to remember. We're talking about or talking to people that are feeling depressed. Um, we got to be very careful in how how we approach them. Um, we we don't want to say, um, you know, what's the matter with you. We got to find out what happened to them because we're seeing that the depression and, and grief and and those kinds of feelings are a natural response to to those adverse um, experiences. And when we tell a person that their depression is caused by, a, caused by a brain malfunction, we are telling them that, that they are disempowered, that they have no power over what's going on with them. That they're disempowered, that they're not good enough because their brain isn't good enough. When, and that's not, that's not true. And it pitches the, the person against themselves. They have these feelings of distress, but on the other end of it, they have these feelings of sanity that allow them to say, okay, now I need to you know, have this prescription or whatever. And it just it pits the the same part of them against these these feelings that they're having, and it also tells them that the distress doesn't have any meaning, that there's there's no reason for them to be, um, to, to you know to feel the way that they do, other than their you know their brain's broken or whatever. So we got to be careful in in how we approach that. We're not, you know, people that have depression or anxiety are not defective. Distress is that natural reaction to what happens to us and the way that we're living. Again, going back to those, those causes that I mentioned earlier about, um, you know, those disconnections that, that uh, we've, you know, we've created either for ourselves or just the way the society is, the way our, our culture is, is built up uh, has, has that kind of, a, or can have that kind of effect. Um, he has a, a short chapter about grief. And again, what I said before that uh, grieving and depression, a lot of those symptoms are, are you know, really parallel. There are a lot of parallels between you know, somebody that's suffering a loss and somebody that, that is, has, is having a depressive episode. So in the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, um, there are five versions or there's five editions, I guess. And in versions, in additions one through four, they had this loophole called the, you know, the grief exception. It said that you're allowed to show symptoms of depression or uh, for, uh, in, in the fourth edition, it was two weeks. 
<clears throat> you're allowed to have those symptoms for two weeks and not be considered mentally ill, only if you'd recently suffered the loss of somebody close to you. And uh, he, he shares the story of this lady that, um, that had a child and the baby died, um, uh, the baby died in childbirth. And the woman was, you know, very distraught, really upset, uh, grieving because, and she felt like her, like her body wasn't good enough because her body had destroyed that baby and not given it life. So she was really upset with herself and, and grieving as, as we might expect. And she, she said, you know, talking to all these, these doctors about, you know, how she was feeling and whatnot, she, she said, you know, to say that grief lasts longer than an artificial timeline, like two weeks or a month, uh, limit, uh, a, an artificial time limit uh, is, is uh, pathology, um, that if it's, if it's longer than an artificial time limit, it's pathology, and that denies us, denies the core of of our human nature, uh, that our human our human response to, to those kinds of events. And she asked, why is death the only event that can happen where depression is a reasonable response? Um, so in the DSM-5, they took out that grief exception, exception um, but that leads to, <laughs> that leads to the, the context of your depression is ignored. It totally ignores the, the factors, the, the situations, the environment that you're living in. So, uh, so after that's the, the bulk of the book there, um, he, he, in the sec, in the, the middle there, he, he kind of does this shift here. You know, what if changing the way that we live could be an antidepressant too? If the causes of our depression are uh, our reactions to the way this, our society is built, or choices that we've made, or um, uh, you know, the natural reaction that we have to to those events. What if we change the way we live to help ourselves um, through that depression and eventually out of it? What if those natural things could be an antidepressant too? Um, for example, uh, he gives the story of this guy living in um, in an eastern country. I forget where and. Uh, the man had stepped on a landmine and lost his leg. Or, uh, I don't remember if it was one leg or two leg. Anyway, he lost his legs. They gave him an artificial leg and then he'd go out to work and it was really painful for him to work on those artificial legs. And he, you know, without work, he was really, really down and depressed. Well, about that time, um, they were, that country was introduced to chemical antidepressants. And, and they said, well, what is he, uh, or shortly after this, the, they came with these antidepressants and they said, what do we need antidepressants for? And um, they gave this example, this guy that had lost his legs. And what the community did is they, they gave him a cow and he, um, his, his work shifted from um, this farming of this cow or from, from the rice that he was doing to this cow. And, um, just that change in his, uh, in his work made a huge impact. And you know, he, um, he wasn't depressed anymore. He, you know, he felt alive and, and his life was, was, uh, worthwhile. And what he was doing was, was making him happy. Uh, so just a, a short example there of how changing the way that we live can, um, can help us through and out of those, those feelings that we're having. So again, uh, the disconnections are what are causing our, our depression and our anxiety. So we need reconnections. Um, the lives we're pressured to live aren't meeting our need for connection. So we've got to we got to change things up. And those that we know that are are depressed or anxious, there are ways that we can be there for them. They're not going to be able to pull it. They're not always going to be able to pull themselves together on their own. We need those those community bands, those um, those people around us uh, to help us through that. And I'll explain that a little bit further here in the next couple of slides. Um, so the the first thing he says is that instead of uh, having the focus on ourselves 
um, you know, focusing on our on our ego or whatever it is, that we need to look at ourselves as being part of a whole, being a we instead of an I. Uh, or in addition to an I, be a we, be part of the, the whole community. Um, because a, a desire for a private solution uh, is a symptom of the mindset that causes depression. Or thinking that this is this is my pain I have to deal with. Uh, this is a private thing I'm dealing with. I've got to work through it on my own. And those are the, that's the type of mindset that keeps us in those depressive states. The solution is to do things for others. Now, again, uh, people that are going through depressive episodes are not going to feel like, you know, getting out and doing. Um, that has to be facilitated by those that are those around them, those that care for them, family members and friends and, and the like. And again, we need to change the question from what's the matter with you to what happened to you. We need to help them investigate the causes of the depression or that anxiety. We need to look at what, what happened to them so that we can help them make those reconnections. Again, drugs have their role but there are better, more lasting natural solutions. And again, he was saying, you know, he'd been taking these antidepressants for who knows how long, it could have been years. And he was going into the therapist and the therapist said, you're still, you're still depressed. This might be helping you for a short time, but because the real factors that are causing your depression are not being addressed, these drugs aren't having any effect. So again, you're, there's no point in using these antidepressants if you have not made reconnections. So again, going to the, the solutions here, the reconnections, um, if you're finding that the problem is with your work, um, your, your lack of autonomy, your status, uh, find work that allows you some control and engage in work that has a balance between effort and rewards. You want to feel like what you're doing makes a difference. You want to be able to see that um, there's that you're making an impact in what you do. And when there's that imbalance, you get the feeling like, I don't matter, what I'm doing doesn't matter. And that perpetuates those feelings of depression and anxiety. So we got to work towards uh, getting that balance correct. We got to find work that makes us uh, makes us feel like we matter. Um, if, you, if you or someone you know is going through a depressive episode and maybe the cause is that, um, you know, maybe they are seeking for happiness and materialism and they've kind of lost their, their way as far as uh, looking for their intrinsic motivators, um, things that they're passionate about. Ask yourself or ask them, what do you buy? What do you spend your money on? And then ask them, what do you really value? And see if there's a disconnect between their answers. It can be really, really telling, help reset our minds to uh, what are those values, what are those intrinsic motivators that bring me joy? Because um, the, the fallacy with buying things to make us happy is that that happiness often comes in the anticipation of buying something. It's, it's what happens before we get the thing. Cause then after we have the thing, having it just becomes routine and, or, and ordinary. The excitement is, is comes before that, that getting of whatever it is. So helping people see that disconnect between their intrinsic values and what they're chasing to make themselves happy can be really telling. There's a section in here that I thought was really uh, important and it's, it's called sympathetic joy. And that's a way of cultivating the opposite of jealousy or envy. When we see what other people have and we see that we don't measure up in some way, it can cause jealousy or envy for that person. Um, but practicing sympathetic joy, which is kind of a, it's an exercise where you, you say, um, you, you focus your mind on a, a person that you love and you think, you, you say to yourself, I love this, this person. I, I don't remember exactly how it goes. It's, it's better written in the book, but you, you start with people that you already, that you love and you, 
you kind of go through this, this meditation of thinking about that person, loving them, having loving thoughts, and then you slowly work to people that you do not like or that you're envious of. And you, you, you meditate and you concentrate on having positive, loving feelings towards that person and saving that you, you, you love them, you care about them. And it takes a long time. It's not, a, of course, this isn't an, an immediate fix, but it's a, a way of switching that mindset from being envious and comparing yourself to others to loving yourself and loving others, no matter, no matter what their situation or yours. Um, people who are depressed need an environment where they can talk. Um, they won't, they probably won't up and up, open up if they're pressured to talk, but if you give them an environment where they, they feel comfortable that they can, uh, that's really important. There's a, there's a section in the book about this lady who was really depressed and she, uh, gets involved in a gardening group. They're, they're put in charge of this, this garden that needs, uh, needs reworking in, in a big city. And she's working with other people that, um, you know, kind of have a similar, uh, similar um, difficulties, emotional difficulties of their own in depression and anxiety. And having them work side by side gave them an opportunity to talk about what they're going through and help each other out, have that sense of community instead of feeling like I've got to, you know, work through this on my own and having that way over you being able to kind of uh, share those experiences um, is, is really, really important. Prayer or meditation can also be really helpful, can help you um, um, kind of uh, reset, your, reset your thinking or, um, you know, whatever, what prayer can do for you um, to... Um, kind of help you think about uh, your values, your place in the world. Um, and, you know, if you believe in God, how, how God can help you through yeah, your challenges can be a great benefit as well. There's one quote that, that I underlined that I really like, and I have to edit it a little bit, but you'll get the idea here. Uh, it says, there's always going to be stuff coming into your life to be unhappy is part of the human experience. But if you can be happy for others, there's always going to be a supply of happiness available to you. And I found that quote to be really, really powerful and very true. Um, going to, uh, you know, people that have um, experienced trauma, that um, they've tried to disconnect themselves from uh, by saying that it was, it was my fault or um, I was powerless to, to escape it or overcome it. Having that trauma compassionately acknowledged by an authority figure helps. It was one of the studies that's referenced in the book. Um, they just need to feel that they are accepted no matter what's happened to them. Um, people hide trauma because they're ashamed in some shape or form. And it's holding onto that shame or guilt that makes people sick. So being able to, um, being, giving a person an opportunity to talk through that with someone that they trust, with an authority figure that they trust and, and that will listen and that will accept them uh, is, is, is huge. The, the studies that he references here, um, he, he references them because they have a significant effect. Um, he, he, you know, he compared to the, 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 um, the power of antidepressants, which is, uh, you know, relatively minuscule and only helps a very, you know, a fraction of the people that take them, um, you know, legitimately, um, these these solutions that he's talking about have a significant effect in uh, the person's well-being. They were able to take, uh, you know, studies and take the intake versus uh, the outcome and see a great difference in in their mental health. 
So he concludes by saying that in order for this change to occur, in order for these reconnections to happen, you need two things. You need time and you need confidence in the future. And again, going back to the beginning of the book where he, you know, he ate this apple and it just made him violently sick. He gets to the doctor and the doctor says, don't suppress that nausea. We need that nausea to tell us, you know, what's happening to you, what's wrong with you and how we can help you. So when we're feeling distress in our lives, it's a signal. It's a necessary signal that there's a disconnect somewhere in our lives, whether it's uh, childhood trauma or um, disconnection from respect, uh, disconnection from meaningful work, disconnection from other people. We've got to analyze that and um, look through the solutions to, to those disconnections and figure out how we can reconnect again or how we can help others to reconnect themselves to, uh, to themselves and to the communities that they're in. Um, so the, those are the ways that we bring about lasting change. And those are the things that are going to bring us hope that, um, you know, there is, there's hope for the, for the future, that I'm having a, a bad time, I'm going through um, a rough part of my life, but this isn't going to be, this isn't going to be my life, my life will get better. And people need that hope. And um, I think that many of you listening today, hopefully that you can be the, cat the, the catalyst or the, the helper to help those that are in need at this time that you know that um, need that reconnection. And so I, I found this book to be very powerful, very helpful, very practical. Um, um, and, and just a, a good, um, it has really helped me shift that focus on, uh, you know, what we've been, what we've been taught about depression and how we are supposed to handle it and uh, really um, coming to terms with that and considering all these other, um, other solutions that are, are more, that are in the end more effective, more long lasting uh, and worth pursuing. Um, so again, I, if you haven't had a chance to read that book, I strongly encourage that you read it. Um, if you or someone you know is going through uh, anxiety or, or depressive stage, um, uh, I think you'll find, uh, I think you'll find some answers there. I, I hope you look into that. Um, so that's the end of my, uh, slideshow and, um, thanks for attending. This was wonderful. I mean, I, I really appreciate all the information you shared. We do have a question in the q and I'm also going to encourage everybody to please click on that Google uh, form. Um, I need to um, show a signing sheet. So that can be my signing sheet for this session. Uh, our question is, what if you uh, generally feel like you are the only human on the planet who has gone through or going through certain things? Um, that's a great question. Um, my immediate answer uh, is that um, the situation you're going through may be particular to you. Uh, that's that's entirely uh, probable. The thing I would remember is that the, the situation that you're going through, even though you feel like this is just happening to me and nobody else can, nobody else has the ex experiences. I think the thing to remember is that the feeling can be the same. The, the reaction to whatever you're going through may be very similar to the, the feelings that somebody else is having that went through a either a similar situation or something very different. I think that the, the thing to remember is that, um, that you've both had, or you or someone like you has had a disconnect or has had this uh, you know, adverse uh, experience and you're having that normal reaction and someone else is having that normal reaction too um, and that can be a way of thinking about it that helps you to understand that um, you're not alone in how you feel. 
even though your experiences might be different, you're not alone in, in the feeling and the reaction that you're having. And I think that's important to remember. Yeah, especially these days that we're feeling tired, you know, all the, at first it was just a couple of months, now it's over a year, right? That this whole pandemic is hitting our families, our emotional well-being, and your words are definitely a lot of hope for a lot of us. Thank you. I have a poll and I would like to pull that out. And um, these are just sentences that you can click and say true or false. And maybe Wesley can help us uh, with the information you provide. Can you please answer those questions? Can you see the poll, Wesley? Yes. Good. Okay, one more minute. Okay, <clears throat> we have uh, 20 participants and 12 people have answered the poll. Uh, 13. I don't wanna close the poll before everybody had had a chance to answer. Okay, so let's see what most of you answered on this poll. Um, can you see the result? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first question was depression is all in your head and all the 13 participants answer false. Are you happy with that? Yeah. <laughs> Good job. Medication is the only way to manage depression. False. Everybody said false. They were paying attention. <laughs> Dealing with depression is a normal part of life. 12 and one, what do you have to say about that, Wesley? Uh, that's a, that's a, a, a good one. Um, I think that dealing with grief, dealing with um, sadness is normal. Um, I think that um, if, if you are if it goes beyond, uh, if it's depression, um, I, I see how he says it in the book is um, being, feeling depressed is, is a normal response. Mm -hmm. That depression is, I wouldn't call it normal because not everybody goes through it, but I would say that um, that the feelings that we experience when we are depressed um, happen to probably just about everybody at some point in their life. It doesn't mean that they're depressed. It just means that they're going through a normal experience. So this would not be true because I'm going to say uh, I found all these statements as myth about depression and I wanted to see what all our participants had to say about it. So this is interesting. I like that it says it's a normal part of life, not necessarily a normal part of life, right? Right. Depression is not a, a normal part of life. It's not something that everybody's going to go through. But the right. things we experience in depression or grief, you know, those two are, are, are similar in a lot of ways. The symptoms are very similar. That is a normal reaction. Right. Everyone experiences depression in the same way. Every, almost everybody said false. And then someone said true. What do you think about that one? Well, to be, to have a, a diagnosis of depression, you have to, you have to check a number of boxes um, and they have to be, you know, part, a significant um, um, 
it has to adversely impact your your life, uh, your daily, your your day to day life, and you have to have it for a significant amount of time. Right. Uh, because there are a number of check boxes, you don't necessarily have to check all of them to be diagnosed. Um, I believe that's my understanding. So I wouldn't say that um, everyone experiences depression in exactly the same way, um, but I think um, because there are so many check boxes, it's likely that there are um, a lot of um, a lot of shared experience um, in that. You know, earlier the the gentleman was asking, you know. Um, what if I feel like nobody else has, has felt the way that I have, or I'm going through somebody that I feel like nobody else has gone through. Again, though, those feelings are, are often mutual um, with people that have gone through uh, adverse experiences or depression. So I would everybody experiences it in exactly the same way, but I think there are a lot of, um, um, I think there's a there's a chance that you you may be experiencing depression the same way as somebody else, just not everybody else. Right, just feels different in different individuals. But as you were mentioning, the DSM, which is the Diagnostic Statistic Manual that psychologists use, right? They mm -hmm. a, a symptom has to present in your life for over a period of six months in order for you psychologists to check to check and say, yeah, this has been present, right? And so. That's kind of like, it's not that simple. I'm just putting it in a very yeah. simple way, but that's kind of like the way it goes. So maybe they are presenting in the same way. And then depression is the same as being sad. I'm happy to see that most people said false. What do you think about that sentence? True. Yeah, right? depression is, being, is the same as being sad. Yeah, that's not, that's a false. No, no. And, and so we understand feeling of sadness as an emotion, as a feeling, right? And depression also implies this chemical thing going on in our body. And that might be one of the differences as well, right? Yeah, um, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say that depression is, is caused by that, that chemical imbalance in our brain. I would say that um, our brains have plasticity to them and having adverse effects can, can mold, uh, can, can um, because our brains, our brains have that plasticity to them, those experiences can change our brain, but they can also be changed back again. And depression is, um, is not the same as being sad, I would say, because, um, because of the, the depth and scope of that emotion and how long it lasts. We say that being sad is, is a reaction to something that's going on with you, but it's, um, I guess in the way that we typically use it, it's, it's not debilitating. It's not having an adverse effect on our day-to-day -day, day -day life. We're still able to, to go about and do a lot of the things that we would normally do. And it's relatively fleeting, but depression, you know, you really don't feel like doing anything. Um, you don't really feel like doing those things that would ordinarily bring you joy or, and, and sometimes you you don't feel like doing anything at all, even those things that are absolutely necessary in your day. Mm -hmm. And yeah. in that way, they're not the same. Exactly. <clears throat> Wesley, I have no more than uh, no more to say. I really appreciate the time you have invested with our families. Um, next week, we are going to have another teacher from West Valley, and she's going to talk about um, technology and cyberbullying, such an important topic that sometimes leads to depression on our students, right? When cyberbullying happens, I will be sending the um, link and the invite for everybody. Thank you for attending and thank you for signing in in, your, in our um, Google form. And so my name is Minerva Pardo and I am the Family Engagement Coordinator for West Valley. Thank you so much and see you next week. Thank you everybody.